there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I
Father, we, um, we come together in, in worship here to, uh, to look to you together. And we ask your, your guidance, your blessing on this time. We are grateful for the rain. Thank you so much for sending the rain and uh, just allowing that uh, for us right now. And um, Lord, I want to lift up just the names of these who are struggling with their health, Lord, for Loretta, for Jerry, for uh, the family of Mary Lou. Alma, uh, for Andrea, for Glenn, for Will, for Kathleen. Lord, we know there are others. Um, Lord, we pray for healing. Lord, we pray that your power be manifest in, in these lives, in the lives of these people, Lord. Father, again, we ask your blessing on this time. We thank you for this time, and we ask your blessing on this time together. Guide Will as he, uh, William, as he brings the message this morning, and 
We just pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, welcome. You can be seated. Welcome on this rainy Sunday. They were right. It really is raining out there. Um, uh, if you decided to stay home, we understand, but uh, you're the brave ones here. Made it out in the, probably even got a little wet from the car inside. We have some things coming up. Um, next Sunday is some sort of harvest festival that I'm kind of calling Church of Ween, because that's just an awesome name. Um, so we're going to have a, a, the kids have a song they're working on. You can dress up, uh, you know, wear your, your, your favorite non-gory costume. And uh, if you would like, uh, and afterwards, we're going to have a potluck. We'll, we'll also have some food that the church provides, but you can bring something to share. Uh, it's supposed to not be rainy next, uh, next week. I've looked. And Sharon and I are doing a, a booth where you throw darts at the balloons because I love that booth. <laughs> and uh, basically, things like this are all about me, and I love that. I want to do it. So if you, adults or teens, if you have a booth that you would want to do, uh, or you could take a 10 to 15 minute session in ours if you want. But if you have one that you would want to do, it's open, all right? Bring the stuff, set it up, we'll have fun with it. So we're having bounce houses, photo booths, and, and that sort of thing right after church and during next week. Uh, Four weeks from today is the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and we'll also do a meal right after church then. Uh, you're invited to bring some kind of a soup or stew to share, and the church will provide a bunch of pizzas, and we'll have pizza and stew, which every Thanksgiving should consist of. Amen. All right. And then um, I saw something else up there that I wanted to mention, but now it's not up there. Oh, live nativity. Last thing before the kids take off. Uh, the second weekend in December, you can see the dates there. We are doing the live nativity. Uh, all hands on deck, please. <laughs> uh, there is a place for you. We might simplify it a little bit, but it will be an interactive fair like we've done. We will have 25 to 30 different animals out there ready to pet and interact with you. Uh, Mary and Joseph will be there. I've talked to them. No. <laughs> They don't know who they're going to be yet, but uh, somebody will be Mary and Joseph. So put that on the Savior dates, uh, the work days you can see there, November 22nd, December 4th, and we'll get going on that and have sign-ups, but make sure that's on your Save the Date uh, calendar there. All right. Well, if you are fifth grade and under, you can head off to your class, and we will move into our communion time. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, at this time, we are, as a, as a church, a body of believers, we are going to go into our, our communion time, also known as the Lord's Supper in some denominations and churches. And this is a, a very important time that I'll dig into in a second. But first, before I get into that, I want you to know, um, you might be here kind of new or kind of unsure about where you stand on this whole Jesus thing. Uh, maybe you're exploring, maybe you're trying to understand more. Maybe it's not quite for you yet. And I want you to know, and those of you at home who might be watching in the same way, I want you to know you're welcome here. We are glad you're here. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable with partaking of this particular very important, uh, for lack of a better term, ritual, tradition that we have, that's okay. You can feel free to pass it along. You're not, you're not obligated. Uh, if you are a follower of Christ, though, if you're a, a, a saved believer, in Jesus Christ, we, we welcome you to partake with us this morning. Uh, so as I was kind of preparing, pre sorry, preparing <laughs> and studying up for uh, this communion devotional, I, 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 I found 
just some interesting little historical tidbits, or one in particular. Uh, many of us know the story of the, the Last Supper of Christ and uh, the Passover celebration that he was celebrating with his disciples the night before he was crucified. Many of us are also familiar with when he said, uh, eat of this bread, it is my body. Take and eat, this is my body, do in remembrance of me. Very important words that, that we reflect on at this time. And what I discovered that was interesting was that that's actually a part of a marriage ceremony or, or one type of marriage ceremony in that time where the husband would actually share some bread with the, with the bride-to-be, excuse me, the groom and the bride. And he would be saying, uh, eat this bread, and it represents how I pledge my body to you, my bride, to protect you, defend you, provide for you. I give my body to you and everything I am to you. So it's interesting that Christ uses these words with his disciples that it's probably why it kind of perplexed them a little bit and, and made it a little bit confusing. Jesus, why are you telling us this? Are you, are you getting married to us? Because it's kind of weird. We're not sure how we're good with that. And it probably took some time to reflect and understand. You know, back in the Gospel of John, uh, another kind of interesting tidbit is that there's, there's no uh, specific account. There's an account of the Last Supper, but not, not in the traditional words and way we look at it sometimes during these devotionals. We don't actually have a recorded moment in John where Jesus says, take, eat, this is my body, drink, this is my blood, do this in remembrance of me, and so forth. But he does say it earlier in John chapter 6, way back at the beginning, starting in verse 53, this is right after he feeds the 5,000. And he says, uh, you know, his, his disciples and a bunch of people actually are saying, you know, how, what are you saying when, he, when you say, this is my flesh to eat? What are you talking about? And he says, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true, true drink. Excuse me. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. It sounds pretty similar to the communion words in the actual Last Supper, but at this time, with this big crowd of people, they were weirded out. Like, what would you do if Pastor Bill came up here and was like, look, you've got to just take a chunk out of my arm right now, take a bite. It might be a little... Like, I'm not sure about this church. No offense, Bill. <laughs> and sure enough, at that time, a lot of people left following Jesus. They, they gave up on what essentially was eternal life because they were confused, and this was a level of commitment that they weren't sure of. And it was, it was a, these words that kind of were meant for maybe a sacred marriage ceremony, but not just for preaching a sermon and talking to people. And they were like, Something's, something's off. I don't know what to do with it. So what is, what is Jesus saying, though? He's, he's laying out the seriousness, the solemnity, if you will, of his challenge to follow him, of his challenge for eternal life. It's not fun and games. It's a serious remembrance of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. He was saying, literally, I pledge my body, I pledge who I am to you, not to copy too much of how William speaks, but to the bride, right? To the bride of Christ, to us. He says, you are my bride, and I pledge everything I am, including my very life, to care for you, to defend you, to protect you. Take and eat, and this is my body. So that's what we celebrate this morning, and celebrate is a strange word to think of what we're acknowledging. We're acknowledging Christ's sacrifice. But there is so much joy in that because through his sacrifice, we have freedom. We have freedom from sin and from death. He pledged his body so that we could be free. If you would like to partake, there are stations at one, two, three, I think four different, five, different areas of the church 
and uh, feel free. These are, these are individual packets. If you're at home watching us, we, we encourage you, you know, whatever elements you can find to partake, crackers, bread, juice, wine, whatever it may be, we encourage you to, to partake as we celebrate the sacrifice of Christ together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. And as we, as we are gathered here, we, we recognize your, your pledge of your body, your broken body, your shed blood for us. And it's not, about, it's not about being weird or being confused or being nervous. It's, it's about giving our all to you because you gave your all for us, God. We love you and we honor you and we ask that you bless this time of communion as we do this in remembrance of you. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Steve is going to teach me how to play the piano. I'm going to learn in five days. Watch. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Marlow Hills Christian Church. Those of you that are here, and welcome to Marlow Hills Christian Church online for those of you at home. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to to be serving up the word this morning. And what I want to do is give a, a quick overview of where I'm going so that, and the clicker as well, so that as I go, the question isn't, oh dear, where's William headed to? But rather, we know exactly where William's headed to. So I'm going to be focusing on John chapter 11. 
Shortest verse in the Bible. What? Jesus wept, right? Many of us in this room have probably won a lot of contests that way. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Now, the question, though, is why? And the second question is, will you? Jesus wept, and will you? And so as I go through this, I'm going to be exploring exactly why he wept, what brought him to the place of weeping. But also, even more so, what was moving him and what he was showing about himself, that he is the resurrection. He's the only resurrection. And as I go through this, at the very end, I have a poem that I would like to share that Zach is going to play for us. Um, and, and it goes to the point of why we celebrate, why we know Jesus as the resurrected Christ, our eternal life. And so, how does that sound? All right, all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. But before that, I want to pray. Father, we belong to you. All who have put their trust in the Christ belong to you. All that you have breathed your eternal life into belong to you. To trust, to know, through every aspect of life, we belong to you. And we're grateful that you came and lived a life that we could not live ourselves and died a death that we all deserved so that we may know you in your love, to know you in your joy, and to walk with you through every facet of life, the good, the bad, the ugly, the unknown. However, knowing you every step of the way. So would you speak this morning? Would you speak through me and to me and to us, your bride? In the name of Jesus the Christ, the anointed Messiah. Amen. So, as the title states, Jesus wept, will you? I, I tend to think that it's not so much just Jesus wept. Well, what does that mean? This vibrated. Aha. Now, that's not all. <laughs> well, I'm glad I printed out my stuff. Aha. A desperate call for help. What I'm going to be doing is not just going through Jesus wept, 1135, but I'm going to have all of the information, per se, on the screen so that I summarize a lot of it, um, but also that you have the ability to look at it for yourself. I encourage you to go home today through this week and study it for yourself because I am offering a perspective of what the, what the gospel is already saying. But maybe, just maybe, when you're sitting at home or in your car or with your family, Holy Spirit will say, I want to point this out to you too. That is very important for any of us and all of us. Now, there's a desperate call for help, verses 1 through 3. So, Mary and Martha send to Jesus this letter, a message saying, Hey, Lazarus, your friend, the one you love, he is sick. We need you to come and see about him. We want you to come, please, hurry. He's ill. Specifically, it says, 
A specific man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. I want to point out two things. There's two loves that, that is used in this passage. And you'll be able to see it. Ah, there it is. See? <laughs> you'll see it that this first love is phileo. This friend of yours that you love, this endeared friend, he's sick. We, we need you to come see about him. Does anybody in here have a, a dear friend that if they called you or texted you or sent you a letter right now and said, I'm sick, I need you to just come and be with me. How many of you would go? We would go and be with our dear friend. So they're pointing out, you spent some time with us. You know us. You know Lazarus. He's sick. I, I need you to come. You love him. That's number one loved. Phileo. This is your friend. But something interesting ends up happening. The master plan is in effect. Because verses 4 through 8, it says this. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. What? There's got to be something unique about this. If it doesn't lead to death, and all of us really know what has happened in this passage in chapter 11, then Jesus must be pointing something else out for us. It is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Pause. If you go to chapter 9 of John, there's, there's a, another, another story that Jesus is in. There's this little boy who's born blind. And the question ends up being, who sinned that this boy was born blind? And Jesus' response, much like this, was, no one sinned, but it was for the glory of God that his glory would be shown through what I'm about to do. It echoes here. There's nothing misplaced or incidental about this situation. I want to point that out. Now Jesus, verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. There's that second love. That love specifically is agape o, agape o. And that love isn't the same as, that's my beloved friend. He ferociously loved them. He had a love for them that surpassed how he felt. And it's not that Jesus did not feel and that he does not feel for us. After all, God created our emotions, so how could he not feel for us? But the scripture is pointing out, he intentionally loved them, and that there's something a lot deeper happening and about to happen. And so in verse 5, now Jesus loved Mary and Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, guess what he does? He stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Jesus was about 1.7 miles or two miles to round it off away. I could walk two miles in a day, and it may take me two, three, maybe four hours, and the rain, five. Right? But Jesus intentionally decides to stay where he was after he received, your dear friend is sick. Come see about him. And the scripture says, but he agape old. He ferociously loved them. There's something else happening here. Now, 
Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, uh, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. And you want to go again? And, and so there's a problem. There's a problem here. Your friend is sick. You decide to stay for two extra days. And then you want to go back to the place where trouble is? Where surely your death may be because they just tried to stone you? Well, let's look at what Jesus has to say about that. As I said in verse 5, Jesus loved Martha and his sister Lazarus. That word agapeo is an indignation. There's an indignation to that love. I love you. But I also realize that it means actively doing what the Lord prefers with him by his power and direction. His love is always defined by God. It is a discriminating affection which involves choice and selection. Let me bring that in just a little bit. I was in North Carolina, and uh, I was with my niece. She has a little daughter named Serena. And she's the cutest little thing. And Serena would come up to me and say, Uncle Barbie, you want to watch Archibald? And Archibald is some little cartoon. And, uh, and, apo- and apart from her calling me Uncle Barbie, because she can't say all the words, I said, nobody else gets to call me Uncle Barbie. <laughs> all right, you understand? I'm letting you know right now, nobody else. <laughs> and this particular day, she, she asked me, Uncle Barbie, you want to go watch uh, Archibald? And her little eyes caught me. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll I'll go watch. So we go and sit on my niece, her mother's bed, and she lays her head on my leg, and I see her eyes fluttering, and she's trying to fight this sleep. And I'm sitting there, and it occurs to me as I look over to the door, If somebody came through that door to try to hurt this precious one that I love, it's all over for them. And and I'm just being honest. I'm just being honest. That is that's what rose up in my heart. Like if anybody came after her, it's all over. And Holy Spirit said, Son, that's how I've always loved you. With that kind of ferocious love, you belong to me. That's how he loves us. You belong to me. And if anyone comes after you, I'm going after them. That's how I want you to protect. I love you. And so... That is something I think we often miss when we talk about love of God. It's it's kind of this abstract love. God loves me. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean that he loves us? Is it something that is just, you know, popcorn, cotton candy, and, and, and whatever else you could think of? Or is it a tangible, like, man, I belong to him. I'm his son. He's my father. Those are two different things. It's the difference between phileo, that's my endeared friend, and agapeo, I have a deep love for you. You belong to me. 
And whatever I have to do to get you, I'm going to do it now. Walking with the master means walking in the light. In verse 19, not verse 19, in verse 9 through 14, in your notes, if you want to write this in, sometimes Jesus asks us to walk with him into the darkness, knowing, knowing, knowing that he is the light. Why do I say that? Let's look at what Jesus says to the disciples, right? After they've told him, you want to go where? They're, they're wanna, they want to stone you, bro. You want us to go there? Look at what Jesus says. Is there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. Makes sense so far, right? But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles. Listen to what he says. Because the light is not in him. Jesus just pointed out to his disciples that there's something way different than, than they're not capturing right now. He doesn't say because it's not light outside anymore. He says the light is not in in them. He's, he's inviting them to, to know who he is. He's not talking about the natural light. He's talking about himself. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and awaken him. They still don't get it. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, He'll recover. You know, Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought that he was just speaking about rest and sleep. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, I'm just going to let that go. I ain't worried about it. Sometimes in our situations, you know, much like even my own. I was about to go to do this master's. Passionate about doing this master's. Something I love to do, and all of a sudden, bam! Punched in the chest. But, but, but God, why? Why? What, what did I do? What's going on? And maybe, just maybe, and for sure, I believe. He's showing me something different about trusting in him. It's like, you don't get it quite yet, but I'm inviting you to see something about who I've created you to be also. It's not that I'm trying to take something away from you. It's that I'm growing you more to be like me by experiencing things in your life that will draw you closer to me. Now, if God is so good, fill in the blank. If God is so good, why X, Y, Z? We've had a troubling year, a troubling two years. And for some of us, we've just had a troubling decade or troubling life altogether. And we often ask this question, if God is so good, why do I have to go through this? Or why is my friend going through that? Or why in the world don't they have my drink ready yet at Starbucks? If God is so good. Maybe we need to adjust our definition of good. Because certainly it is not God who is at fault for the horrific things that do happen in our lives. Now, does he allow things to happen? Absolutely. I could tell you that from my own personal experience. But it does not mean that he's not good. In verse 15, And for your sake, Jesus said, 
I'm glad that I was not there so that you may what? Believe. Now let's go to him. Oftentimes, the situations that we're going through, whether they be good or bad, ugly, sad, all of those things, I'm drawing you in this way so that you believe in who I say that I am. I want you to know me. I'm the king. I'm the eternal one. It is not that I am I'm hateful or spiteful or don't care about your situation. But if some things just don't happen, you won't believe who I say that I am. I love you. I agape owe you. And I, uh, and I phileo you. And I agape the full spectrum of all of those. so that you may believe. It's good that that happened, so that you may believe. What does that look like in your life today or this week or month or year? Where have you been challenged with your friends, your family, your job, your community, your faith, where God is drawing you in by those challenges so that you may believe? Believe what? that he is who he says that he is. Point four, sometimes Jesus allows for things to happen so that we place our full trust in him and our spiritual well-being. When hard things happen, definitely for me, It is not just the external things that I'm challenged by. It is also the internal things that I'm challenged by. Am I really loved? My disability really messes me up. In the way of saying this, I was talking to to Rachel the other day, and we were talking about some of the challenges we both deal with. And in a vulnerable moment, and I'll just be vulnerable with you, here in the room and at home, One of my insecurities is, can you really love me because I have a brain damage? And that brain damage has affected and affected my life in a certain way. Can you really love me? or, Or will that be too much for you? Now, the answer was, I'm not going anywhere. Hey, shut down. I'm excited about that. But let's bring it in a little bit more. God, don't you see how messy my life is? Don't you see the things that I struggle with in my mind and in my heart? You can't really love me. There's no way. I, my marriage is all jacked up. There's no way you can fix that. I don't got enough skill to get that job. You can't really help me get that job. You know, I I don't know what's going to come tomorrow, but I'm thinking about just forget it. I don't want to wake up in the morning. You can't really help me. I can. I am. I will. I need you to trust in me, not just for the external, but for the internal. I am the resurrection. All of those things. And so it's not just that I was listening to what Rue was telling me and, and thankful that she said, no, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. But that's a reflection of how God loves us too. If you will put your trust in me, I will be there no matter how you feel about yourself. But you got to realize too that your feelings don't predicate or determine who I say that I am. They don't. They can't, because I created you. You didn't create me. Now, in verse 16, so Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, well, let us just go and we may all die with him then. Let's just do it then, Jesus, since you just don't really care. I mean, 
Let's go. And just like Thomas's skepticism, point five, just like Thomas's skepticism, when unhealthy, it will lead to the death of your heart. What do I mean? We could be so skeptic about the outcome of our life that we lose all hope altogether. And it doesn't matter. And we, we forget that tomorrow hasn't come yet. What do I mean? I mean, literally, tomorrow hasn't come, and we don't know what the Lord has in store for us for tomorrow. Whether it's more challenging than it was today or less challenging than today. Whether it's sunshine tomorrow or it's still raining tomorrow. I would think that most of us will hope that it's still raining tomorrow because in California there's a drought. But tomorrow hasn't come yet. It just hasn't. There's more to the story. It's not over. And so then therefore... Don't allow for skepticism to overtake your heart and mind. The enemy would love for you to do that and love for me to do that because skepticism draws us in based upon what is hopeless on the external. But if Christ dwells in us like he says that he does, then skepticism, unhealthy skepticism, must go. It must. It breathes death. And death the enemy loves. Now, the resurrection revealed in the Christ. Encounter with Mary and Martha. Verse 17 through 27, Jesus proclaims who he is as the identity is... uh, Whoops. Proclaims who he is. His identity isn't dependent on how we feel, but about who he says he is. Now, first you got Martha, and she comes, and then Mary comes. Martha states the facts, right? Jesus, you know, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. You know that, right? Well, you know I'm the, I'm the resurrection. Yeah, I know you're the resurrection, and I know he'll be raised on, this, on the last day. I know that. But if, if you would have been here, we wouldn't have been having this conversation. How about that, Jesus? How about that? It's like, I need you to believe who I said I am. And this, this word believe is is I need you to be committed to who I said I am. Not just fickle. I can be fickle sometimes. Because I can look at the external and it doesn't look like it should look and how I want it to look or how I wished it would have looked. And I can get fickle. Can't you get fickle sometimes? All of us can. And you said, I don't want your belief to be fickle. I want your belief to be committed upon who I said I am. That's it. Man, look, when people ask me to cook sometimes, right, and, and if anybody's had ribs and chicken that I've made, you know, I could tell you, you know, I know how to get down with like that. But then somebody comes, well, I really want your ribs and chicken, and then they well, are you sure you know what you're doing? I, I'm not quite sure. All of a sudden, now I'm like, look, why don't you just get away from me? You're you really getting on my nerves. I know what I'm doing. Just wait. Just wait. It's almost done. Because as soon as you put one of these ribs in your mouth, it's, it's all over. Your tongue is about to beat your brains out. You know. But it's a committed belief. A committed belief on who he says that he is. Once it's not committed, like all of us struggle with, it turns into, well, maybe you'll be this way, or maybe you'll be that way, or maybe you won't be at all. So we have to fight to have a committed belief as as opposed to a fickle belief in who Jesus says that he is. Now, Mary states the facts 
but she states the facts with a broken heart. And she comes to him, and she's distraught and hurt. And she also comes with the other Jews who are weeping with her. Did you know that in the Jewish culture, <clears throat> bam, that they would hire mourners? And these mourners would come along, and they were professional mourners. This is what they did. And they would, they would erect emotion. That's what they did. And so, in verses 9, or not 9, what am I talking about? 29 through 37, right? Jesus desires to come, Jesus desires us to come to him with our hearts out and exposed before him. No hired help is needed to move the heart of the master. He doesn't just love with emotion. He loves from his intimate duty to never forsake himself and yet always desiring to draw us to himself. That's our king. Now, I have on there my aunt, and, and I want to share with you this story right quick. That I was in North Carolina, right, and uh, hanging out with my aunt, and one day her uh, grandson was running around the house. He's about five, six years old. He's got a marble in his mouth, right? He's just, doo -doo 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 -doo. and she sees the, I don't know how she saw it. I couldn't see it, but that's just grandma thing, right? And she says, come here. And he comes over, what's in your mouth? And he knows he's in trouble, right? So he's, marble. Get that out your mouth. And so then he, he goes on, right? And he's playing along. How many, about five minutes later, guess what's happened? Marble is in the mouth again. Come here. And I come from a place in a culture where you just got whooped. I mean, it, I, I got so many whoopings, it was crazy, man. I, I, don't, I, I know I, I deserved probably some of them, but I don't think I deserved all the ones I got. But for me, I would get tore up. I mean, tore up. But here's the problem with that. It was never affirming. Now watch this story. He comes in, takes the marble out of his mouth again, and she says, now go in there, go in my room, put your butt up in the air, on my bed, and wait for me. And so she goes in there, and I've got this kind of half crook smile on my face, because I'm like, oh, he's about to get it, you know. And he gets it, and she says, now you stay in there, and you stay there until I call you. And I'm like, ooh. Well, that's just what happens in our family. That's just what happened to me growing up. What I wasn't uh, depending on was this. She's sitting down and she calls him into the room. Come here! And I'm like, oh, he's about to get it again. Just, you know, that, that sharp voice like, oh, man, she wasn't done. <laughs> Come here! And he comes and he's right here. I was like, oh. Man, he's really about to get it. I wasn't counting on this. He comes in front of her and she grabs his arms and shakes him. <laughs> don't you know I love you? And I don't want you to die? Don't you get it? I love you. And she is crying. He is starting to cry and I'm crying. And it's the first time in my life that I see affirmative discipline. And I realize I'm crying for a couple of reasons. Because I wish that that's the kind of discipline I received when I was getting tore up so that I wasn't afraid of discipline. And I was crying because I saw the beauty of that very discipline that she showed him. 
And that discipline is the same discipline that God gives for us. That is agapeo. I will do what I need to. You belong to me. You're my son. You're my daughter. But I will never, ever, ever reject you in my discipline. It's to draw you in to know me. You belong to me. And that just jacked me up, man. And so that's how I discipline now. Whether, I, whether it's, you know, other kids, I'll pull them aside. But hey, I am pulling you aside to embarrass you. I'm pulling you aside to show you respect and not to let you get away with, you know, silly stuff, but to let you know that you're loved. I will protect you, but you ain't going to act a fool here. (laughs) And so, as I move on, later on, if you believe If you believe, you'll see the glory of God. Now, I want to read this particular part in 38 through 44 quickly. Then Jesus deeply moved again. That deeply moved again isn't just like distraught, like, oh, no, what am I going to do? He's deeply moved as in, you don't get it yet. I'm about to show you who I am. I'm the resurrection. You're over here crying because you're hired to cry, and you don't get it. And you, I, my heart is broken because your heart is broken. I love you. And I'm looking because I know what's about to come for me. But I'm going to show you who I am. Deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone laid against it. Jesus, take, uh, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha and si- the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a funk, <laughs> for he has been dead four days. Keep in mind, Jesus was only about two miles away from this. Jesus said to, said to her, did I not tell you that if you, what, believed, committed to believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his high eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around that they may, what, believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the man who had died came out, and his hands and feet were bound in linen strips and his face wrapped in cloth, Jesus said to him, said to them, unbind him and let him go. Agapeo. Not only agapeo, this is my friend that I phileo. I dearly love you, but the purpose of the Father is for me to show you that I am the resurrection. Agapeo. I agape you so much that I'm about to show you what I'm about to do. Lazarus coming out of that tomb was a foreshadow of what was about to happen for Jesus himself. He's about to go to the cross and be put in a tomb. If you believe, you'll receive the glory of God, which is the resurrected life in Jesus Christ alone. And lastly, the glory of God is the resurrected life that is found in Christ alone, the anointed Messiah. The glory of God is the resurrected life in Christ. We are, if you are in Christ, you are the glory of God. The resurrected life. 
you have eternal life. That is the glory of God, and the enemy hates that. And our king ferociously loves that because we belong to him. If you have not yet surrendered your heart to to Jesus the Christ, surrender your heart. He wants you. He wants you, and he wants you to know him. He's beautiful. He's beautiful. That's good. But for everything you go through in life, good, bad, ugly, happy, sad, mad, glad, and all the other adjectives, he wants you. He wants me. My disability doesn't stop him. My, my whatever doesn't stop him. Your challenge doesn't stop him. But he wants to bring you through that so that you may know him and be resurrected in him. What needs to be resurrected in your life? Your friends, your family, your marriage, your work, your, your future, your now. What does he want to resurrect in you now? And so this poem that I have created. Uh, Zach is going to play, but as, as that is about to be played, um, that poem is in your bulletin for you to read as well. But after this poem, I ask Steve and the worship team to come up and, and to play one more song. Uh, thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, and with that, we will play this poem. Why won't we just wake up? So busy trying to put cake up, but only if life was really that sweet. BLM, all in the airways, carried by the prince, touchdown in T minus, but no one knows when the true king will come, but he must be close. Activity everywhere, but you can't see the ghosts, but they live hidden in human hosts. Why occupy Wall Street when they have the king's capital, the human heart? Why won't we just wake up? Why won't we just wake up? We're so busy trying to put cake up, but only if life were really that sweet. When you grow up, you could be what you want to be. But before you know what that is, let's just take a moment to hijack your identity. It's not like you'll be voting anytime soon. But by the time that you're there, I'll have you so hemmed into my plan that you won't be able to stand together. Come to our mentality of solidarity, equity, equality, and homogeny. Just like we planned parenthood, only for you to forget how to. So just plan your life and not parenthood. We'll take care of all of the missing pieces for you. It doesn't even matter anymore. And we won't tell you that there's contraceptive care available without killing the essence of life in you. But our essence of existence is dedicated to sucking the essence of life out of you. Yet we don't care at essence what brought you to the point of questioning the essence of who you are, the protector of life. Why won't we just wake up? We're so busy trying to put cake up but only if life was really that sweet. Hands up, don't shoot, but we throw up our hands in the aftermath to loot. Tearing up the communities we say that we love instead of teaching the basics of communal love. Like if the young men that can love without a glove, stepping away from their seed, bastardize another generation and knowing only the pain that his or her mother has internalized. Your father doesn't want you, and I almost didn't either. Sitting in the waiting room of her planned demise, something in her linger. 
I want to give life and be life, to be a conduit of blessing, but my situation is so vexing. I get all the handouts that I never asked for, but all I remember wanting was my family intact in the home, cultured and ready to replicate and dedicate my very being to the purpose of my very human being, Imago Day. Why won't we just wake up? We're so busy trying to put cake up, but only if life was really that sweet. A sexualized culture breeds a traumatized, idealized culture that believes that love is merely transactional. And if you're rejected enough by your translucent approach to your reformed sexuality, most may know your preferred sexing, but never the beautiful essence of you. Created Imago Day from day one of your inception. Woven together methodically, thoughtfully, and there's a part of me that intimately gets it. Because when I was younger, I got it too. I also have ghosts living in the attic of my host. But the beautiful one came and is and has been reclaiming his estate one inch at a time. A home that had been foreclosed on is now his place of peace, where he shows me how to create and serve up his peace. And not just a piece of the pie per se, but his whole work of peace for me, in me, through me, and to me to follow his footsteps in Mago Day. Why won't we just wake up? We're so busy trying to put cake up, but only if life was really that sweet. In the face of my pain, I comprehend your beauty, and it draws me to you in a profound way, to see you, to see me placed strategically in your beauty. You haven't promised me ease, but you promised that you would appease the roaring sea in me. Peace, be still. You are my silver lining in the clouds of my doubt, and you bring me into your reality. You are from everlasting to everlasting, the eternal one. You are father, friend, master, king, conqueror of my heart. You are inexplicable, and I can't reason you out, but I'm thankful that you have come in and covered me in your grace in your essence and in your eternality and my intimate longing is to know your purpose in me as a gift to me through me and to the world to know you in your intimacy intricately in my gold day y'all stand sing with us this song talks about that resurrection uh, for us it's been a long time since we've sung it but it's a great song it says uh, death was arrested without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only
when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made I'm a prisoner no My shame was a ransom Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when death was arrested and my life began.